Today on Dry Powder, I'll cover the key insights from Bain & Company's 2023 mid-year private equity report, including the fact that deal values are down about 45% this year versus last. Exits are in an even a tougher spot, they're down nearly 70%, and fundraising as a result is under tremendous pressure and on track to drop by nearly 30% by the end of the year. Even though the numbers sound great, we need to remember that ever since June of 2022, the market has been waiting for a recession to occur. And it's been a little bit like waiting for Godot because we're now 12 months into this, nothing's fundamentally broken. It's not clear that there's going to be a recession anytime soon. And that begs the question, when are we going to get back to deal making? I'm Hugh MacArthur, Chairman of Bain's Global Private Equity Practice, and this is Dry Powder. You know, I remember hosting a panel back in Berlin at Super Return in June called the What the Heck is Really Going On Out There panel, which I think is still the question as we sit here at the mid-year. As you look at the global economy, nothing is really fundamentally broken. Absent some type of black swan event, which by definition is not really predictable, we'd expect deal makers to get back to actually doing deals sooner. And I mean doing them at scale in an environment that's hopefully stabilizing, if not attractive. Interest rates moved upward very quickly, but we've been here before. Let's remember that the federal funds rate is about where it was in 2006 and 2007. And until the outlying year of 2021, those were the two biggest deal-making years in the history of the industry. So it's not like interest rates are at a point where we can't get deals done. Now, inflation is higher than normal, but corporate earnings actually remain solid in many, many sectors. In fact, in some sectors, you'd call them robust. And we don't really see a broken banking system or huge asset bubbles or things that happened in 2009 and the Great Recession that really portend multi-year problems that really require fixes. So we're not seeing that in the market right now. There's nothing fundamentally broken. So the question is, why are we not getting back to deal making or when are we going to get back to deal making? And one of the big economic issues, microeconomic issues I see in the industry to get it fully back online, as it were, is that we need to get some capital flowing in larger amounts back to LPs. Job one is really getting money through exits and other liquidity solutions into LP pockets so that they feel the confidence in investing more in the industry now and in the near future. There's a very large backlog of portfolio companies that we'll talk about to exit, and the LPs do need the liquidity. The industry can arguably afford to wait uh, for some time before really kicking back into high gear, but on both fronts, investments and exits, it does beg the question, What's the industry waiting for? Will 12 months from now be any different or better than today? So let's talk about investments. To be certain, there are definitely challenges to getting deals done. Financing large deals is challenging because loans are more costly and lenders, particularly banks, are holding a very high bar for underwriting. The good news is that private credit is actually stepping in. It's prevalent in the middle market, and increasingly, we are seeing private credit funding larger and larger transactions. Some measure of the ongoing uncertainty in the market means that there's actually a gap also between buyer and seller price expectations, and that's persisted over the last 12 months. The question is how long those notions of a difference in the bid-ask spread are going to persist if the economic data coming out of Western Europe, the U.S., and other economies continues to be stable, if not attractive. These two major factors really led to a slow first half of the year. You know, investments by the numbers look kind of like this. The 2023 annualized global buyout deal value is tracking down about 45% versus 2022, and annualized deal count is off by about 40%. Add-ons continue to be prevalent in the global buyout market. Uh, they only account for 11% of total value so far this year, but they're about 60% of the deal count. So a lot of the transactions getting done are add-ons, but they tend to be smaller add-ons to platforms that are much, much larger. Interestingly, average purchase price multiples in the U.S. remain quite high at almost 12 and a half times EBITDA as Q1 data. That's the latest that we have. And that's actually up a little bit from 2022's full year number. European multiples, by contrast, have actually eased more. And the latest data point we have, which is also end of Q1, is about 10 times EBITDA. So that's a much wider spread than you would typically see between U.S. and European deal markets reflecting, I think, U.S. earnings, movement in GDP, 
technical recession in Germany and obviously with the shooting war in Europe, but tremendously widespread right now in the price for U.S. earnings versus uh, European earnings. Dry powder remains steady at about $3.7 trillion globally across all private asset class strategies, and $1.1 trillion of that is flagged for buyouts. And if you dive into that buyout dry powder, about 75% of it is what I'll call fresh powder, if I can use a skiing metaphor, and that means it's less than three years into the investment period, so there's still a lot of time to actually put that money to work. And the current level of dry powder, if you look at it overall for buyouts, represents about three to four years worth of typical deal investment. Typical meaning kind of the average value of the last five to seven years worth of deals. And if you look at the amount of dry powder versus deal activity going back about 20 years, that's kind of in the normal range. So any concerns about too much dry powder for buyouts appear to be unwarranted at this point. Now let's talk about exits. Exits actually fell even more sharply than investments during the first half of the year, and all exit channels were down significantly. 2023 annualized global buyout backed exits is tracking down 67%, so two thirds down, while exit count is tracking down 40% versus last year. So a very pronounced issue. And the exit backlog is huge. There are over 26,000 portfolio companies currently sitting in buyout funds, and that represents $2.7 trillion in unrealized value. Nearly one quarter of those buyout portfolio companies have already been held by GPs for six years. So it's six years and counting for a quarter of those 26,000 companies. GPs really do need to schedule and strategize on how to unlock this $2.7 trillion in portfolio assets that they're managing. Do we need to take a fresh look at the values that were underwritten? What can be done to maximize earnings and get cash back at acceptable returns? These are the urgent questions now that the industry needs to answer. Why is that? Well, LP cash flow turned negative in 2022 after being quite positive in 2021. And in fact, if you look at the past five years, cumulative cash flows for LPs, they are negative. And capital calls have been outpacing distributions in aggregate for all of that time. So for how long and how deep these negative cash flows go really remains the biggest outstanding questions as a concern for LPs. Now, there's a distinction between assets funds are actually selling, which is typically how we think about liquidity, and money that can actually be sent back to limited partners. GPs are increasingly looking at secondary market solutions for liquidity as well. So things like continuation vehicles, portfolio strip sales, NAV loans are all on the table to get cash back into LP pockets. So it's not always a full exit and a full sale that can work, but it can be a partial exit or some type of creative recapitalization that can help ameliorate this issue as well. And the LPs that we talk to are inclined to take those options where they can in order to help ameliorate their cash flow situation. I'd like to also talk a bit about fundraising because obviously a dearth of deals and an even greater dearth of exits impact a GP's ability to raise new monies. You won't be surprised to hear fundraising is very challenging right now. And LPs are in what feels like a cyclical squeeze, even though in many markets we're not in the recessionary times, it feels like recessionary times and the cash flows are tracking that way for many LPs as they look at their models. So global private capital raised so far this year is tracking 30% lower than last year. And the number of funds actually closing is tracking down about 45% versus 2022. So very substantial numbers. Uh, LPs already have a large amount of existing unfunded commitments as we've discussed the dry powder issue and many firms have raised large funds in quick succession in recent years so in addition to being cash flow negative lps are feeling the pressure of and i have 1.1 trillion dollars that's out there and can be called any time by gps for buyouts and in total 3.7 trillion dollars worth of exposure to all private asset classes that's a lot of money the other thing to note is that competition for lp capital has never been more intense there are now almost 14,000 private capital funds on the road today, seeking an aggregate of $3.2 trillion in capital. Compare that to the $3.7 trillion in existing dry powder, and you're talking about seeking an almost doubling of the dry powder in the industry. Trends also show that that's over $3 being sought for every dollar that will be raised. And this supply-demand imbalance has not been this extreme since the global financial crisis in 2009. So, 14,000 folks on the road looking to raise capital, 
three dollars of demand for every dollar of supply it is a very intense stressful environment right now for everyone trying to raise capital and the big unlock is obviously going to have to be getting back to deal making at scale providing a lot of liquidity and getting some of these 26,000 portfolio companies liquidated so the cash flows can get back into LP pockets and that will then stoke the fundraising machine and allow the industry to continue to grow on an attractive trajectory as it has in the past. Now, the last thing I'd like to say about fundraising is that DPI or distributions as a percentage of paid in capital has come into focus. Uh, there's a quip that we've uh, used and seen in a number of environments that says DPI is the new IRR as LPs look to both validate GP performance and recycle capital into new fund commitments. Now, DPI becoming the new IRR really means two distinct things in this environment. One is the obvious, proving that capital can actually come back to LPs at acceptable returns, and then they can recycle that capital back into the private market industry. But very importantly, secondly, proving that the GP marks are valid in an environment where assets haven't been trading much in over a year. We haven't had a lot of deals, exits are way down. We have these marks that have been out there, and of course things get marked every quarter, but if assets aren't trading in different subsectors, it's very hard to know Who's marking things conservatively? Who's marking things less conservatively? And what does this asset really worth? So confidence in GP strategy, as much as performance, is really important when we talk about DPI being the new IRR. So it's both a means to liquidity, as well as it is confidence that the returns are going to be what LPs are expecting from GP valuations. Now, since I've just mentioned returns, let's focus in a little bit on returns themselves. Whether you're an existing owner or a future buyer or both, the increasing cost of debt means that company earnings, which we typically describe as EBITDA, they need to go up. There's no magic to the math, but a fresh look and focus on how to drive up EBITDA is required. So questions like, do I need a new value creation plan? Am I stuck in the middle of something that won't work because of current interest rates and inflation? One thing that's clear is that in this quote unquote, no landing scenario, higher interest rates and inflation will persist. So simply waiting things out is no longer an option for most GPs. It's time to act. And if I do have the right plan, am I pulling all the right levers to drive profitable revenue growth? Are my portfolio companies gaining share? Can they gain share? Are there obvious adjacencies to exploit, pricing opportunities to exploit? The last decade of value creation has been largely about revenue growth and multiple expansion. Have GPs built or rebuilt the muscles to create real margin growth and operating leverage? especially in sectors like software where margins have not been the focus to date. There's an elemental question to prove it in the market where profitable growth has been promised, but the growth part is all the investors have seen over most of the last decade. So the sky certainly isn't falling for returns or even for the industry more broadly, but the cost of waiting is increasing, as is the urgency to diagnose opportunities, act quickly on them, and get the capital recycling machine back to firing on all cylinders. If you'd like to read the full 2023 Mid-Year Private Equity Report, you can find a link in the episode notes. We've also included a link to our latest research on how the top private equity firms are learning how to fundraise in these challenging times. I'm Kim MacArthur. Thank you for listening.